Let's turn to Numbers chapter 9. I was going to preach this message the second hour, but this message shows us the work of our Lord Jesus, and the next one will show us more of the effects of this work. So I think this order will be better. So this message may be a little, a little longer, but the next one will probably be a little shorter. Numbers 19.1. I'm going to preach from this whole chapter, so I'm just going to read a little at a time. Verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which is never came a yoke. Our subject's the red heifer. Now, in the law here, the Lord commanded that it, before, before a sinner could come to the Lord's house and partake of the Passover, he had to be purified, sanctified. He had to be washed. And this was just washing ceremonially, but he had to be washed before he could come up. You remember when the Lord was at the feast in John 11, it says many came up out of the country to be purified that they might take the Passover. That's, that, as far as the scripture reveals, was the last time a red heifer was sacrificed to make this water of separation. It was, that was the last time. They went up there to be purified. Now, in the news, you may have heard that Israel has these four red heifers. Have y'all heard about that? Um, and what they plan to do is uh, they got these from Glen Rose, Texas, and they shipped them over there, and they have them now. They put them up. They're examining them. They have to be without spots, so they're looking them over. And, and what they plan to do is they plan to, they've uncovered the, the apparently the uh, pool of Siloam has filled in with sand. They uncovered the pool of Siloam. They're going to fill it back up with water, and they're going to burn this one of these red heifers and they're going to make this water separation, and then they think they will be pure, and their next plan is, is they're going to build a third temple. But in order to build that third temple, they're going to have to tear down the Dome of the Rock, which is the Muslim's temple. And the spokesperson from Hamas said, that's why Hamas attacked Israel, because of these red heifers, because of their plan to tear down the temp their temple and build the Jews' temple. You know, it's interesting. They think that when they build this temple, that's when the, the Messiah will come for the first time. And you know, when the Lord was at that feast in John 11, remember how they were murmuring with themselves saying, do you think he'll come to the feast? Now, that's what they, if they go through with this, if the Lord's pleased to let them do it, that's what they'll be thinking. It's the Messiah coming. You know, Zechariah said, uh, he says that the, they will say, we will build again the desolate places. And the Lord said, they will build, but I will throw down. And he says, nations will gather around Israel and go to war with them. And he says, and at that time, the Lord will come and stand on Mount, the Mount of Olives, and it'll, the earth will split open, I suppose, by an earthquake from east to west. And uh, am I saying the Lord is about to return? I don't know what the Lord will do. I don't, no man knows the day or the time. But when I think about that and I read those scriptures in Zechariah and Malachi, <laughs> I got excited. It made me hopeful that maybe the Lord is about to return. Um, one of these days, one of these days, like if he, if he came when they're going to do this, that would be in about two or three weeks. And one of these days, we're going to be within two to three weeks <laughs> of the Lord coming again. That's amazing. But now they've done this. They've had these rumblings before and these wars before and had plans like this before, so we don't know. You know, you don't know what the Lord's going to do. But I'm hopeful. I hope he's coming. I, I, that would be a good thing. But you that are sanctified in the heart, you know that this sacrifice has already been offered. And you know that Christ is the red heifer. Everything that's shown here and pictured here is glorifying Christ and the work he does for his people. Hebrews 
9.13 says, If the blood and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, just ceremonial, he said, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, purge you inwardly, from dead works, from the dead work of trying to sanctify yourself and make yourself holy and righteous. Sanctify you from those dead works to serve the living God. That's what's pictured here. Now, first of all, we're sanctified by the will of the Lord Jesus Christ who fulfilled the will of God for his people. The Lord Jesus, by his will, his willingness, he came and fulfilled the whole law of God and took away that first covenant and established the everlasting covenant of grace for his people, ordered and sure in all things. And that's what we have pictured here in verse 2. It says, The red heifer must be without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. Why red? Well, it pictures Christ, Christ covered in blood, and he said his garments, his peril is red. It says in Revelation 19, 13, he was clothed with, clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Why? Because he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Imagine if you tread out some grapes in a winepress, how you'd be covered in, in red. And that's what Christ, that's the picture of Christ on the cross. A heifer is a virgin female cow. That's a heifer. The female is the weaker vessel. And our Lord Jesus took the weak flesh of his bride. We're the weaker vessel. He took the nature of God's elect, of, of the seed of Abraham. Hebrews 2 says the children were flesh and blood. He took part of the same. That he might destroy the devil and deliver us who through fear of death were all a lifetime subject to bondage. It behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren. He was made of a woman, made under the law, made sin for us, made a curse for us, and now he's made higher than the heavens. He reconciled his people to God. And the other reason is because he has suffered the weakness of our flesh, he knows we're dust. This is why he doesn't deal with us after our sins. He's put them away for one, but he also knows the infirmities of our flesh. He knew them without sin, but he knows what, how weak our flesh is. He, did, he pities us like a father pities his child. He's so gracious and merciful and tender with us. This, this heifer had to be without spot or blemish. They're over there now, they're, they have four. I think they had five at first, but now they only have four. And they're going over them with a fine-toothed comb. Because if there's just one hair that's just off-colored, it's blemish. Can't offer it. It's got to be, that heifer's got to be perfect. And that pictures our holy Lord Jesus. It's a virgin cow that's got to be spotless. And that pictures the holy Lord Jesus Christ who knew no sin. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And here's where I get this thing of we're, we're sanctified by the will of our Lord Jesus fulfilling the will of God because this, this heifer upon which never came a yoke. A yoke makes a cow go where it's not willing to go. So this had to be willing, a willing offering. And the Lord Jesus Christ sanctified us by his will in eternity, he willingly became the surety of God's elect, promised to pay everything we owed. He willingly took flesh. He willingly served under the law in perfection. He willingly suffered the death of the cross in place of his people. And I mean, we're talking about perfect will. We're talking about it can't just, you know, you and me will suffer, but we don't really want to suffer. If we had our will, we wouldn't be suffering. Christ willingly suffered. He said, no man takes my life, I lay it down of myself. He said, I gave my back to the smiters and then it plucked off the hair. His people are sanctified by his will, not our will. 
Listen, Hebrews 10, 7, he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. One time. So it's by his will. By his will. Now secondly, Christ took our sin and he was numbered with the transgressors. It says here in Numbers 9 and verse, I mean, Numbers 19 and verse 3, it says, and, he, and you shall give this red heifer unto Eleazar the priest that he may bring her forth without the camp and one shall slay her before his face. Now why Eleazar? Why not Aaron? Aaron was the high priest. Eleazar was his son who was also a priest. Because the Lord said in the scripture, Aaron had to be clean to offer sacrifices. And Eleazar, by offering his sacrifice, is going to be unclean. Both Aaron and Eleazar picture Christ. Christ Jesus, in himself and of himself, is holy like Aaron. Holy, holy, holy. That's the Lord Jesus. But in order for God to pour out justice on the Lord Jesus Christ, he had to be made sin for his people. He hath made him sin for us who knew no sin. You see, you see both in this picture? He made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Brethren, the whole purpose of the cross is to glorify God. It's to show the righteousness of God, how that God is just and everything he does in judgment is perfectly just. He would not pour out justice upon his son until his son was bearing the sin of his people. He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. He does everything in justice. And this being without the camp, that's where unclean lepers were put. That's where they were quarantined away from everybody else. When the spotless, sinless, holy Lord Jesus Christ bore the sin of his people, God numbered him with the transgressors. That's where he suffered was without the count. That's what Hebrews 13, 12 tells us. It says, wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Christ told us, brethren, if we believe on Christ and preach Christ, that he is righteousness and sanctification for his people. He said, if you preach me and believe me, you're going to suffer because man hates that message because it gives him all the glory, gives Christ all the glory. But the Hebrew writer said, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. And that's what we'll do. He bore our sin and our shame and our curse and put it away. And when he's made you see that what he did for you, you'll bear some little reproach from some little sinner that wants to condemn you for believing and preaching this gospel. Christ sanctifies. Here's the third thing. Christ sanctifies, purges, makes pure each of his people personally with his blood in regeneration. It says in verse 4, And Eleazar the priest shall take of her blood with his finger and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. The tabernacle represents the whole church of God. It represents God's true elect who Christ redeemed. And it was Eleazar the priest who sprinkled the blood. Our Lord Jesus Christ our great high priest gets all the glory for sprinkling his blood within our hearts through the Spirit of God. That's how he sanctifies us and purges our conscience. We don't have room at all or any reason at all to glory that sanctification is partly by us. We can't even boast that sanctification is by us, partly by us with the help of the Holy Spirit. 
Christ gets all the glory for making his people holy, sanctified, the same as he gets all the glory for justifying his people and making us righteous. When he's made sanctification to us, that's when we give him the glory and we stop boasting. That's, that's how you can tell the difference between one who's really been sanctified and one who hasn't. One who's been sanctified in heart gives Christ all the glory, declaring him all in this work. Because if the blood of these of, and the ashes of a heifer ceremonially cleansed, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge us inwardly from dead works? That's what repentance is being made to regard ourselves and all our righteousnesses as filthy rags and casting all our care on the Lord Jesus. He sprinkled that blood seven times. That's the number of perfection. And brethren, when Christ laid down his life for his people, he perfected his people. We're not perfect in ourselves because we still have a sin nature. We'll never be. But we're perfect in Christ. That's what he, when he does give you this new heart and sanctify you in this new heart, he turns you to behold Christ and how he perfected his people. That's what he goes on to say in Hebrews 10, 14. By one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And he says, whereof the Holy Ghost is a witness to us. God said, I'm going to write my everlasting covenant of grace on their heart and they're going to know me and he's going to declare in our heart their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. What's the result of that? Well, remission of these is there's no more often for sin. The Hebrew writer said if those sacrifices had really perfected them, really justified them, really made them holy, they'd have stopped offering them. They'd have ceased to be offered. When are you going to be turned from dead works of trying to make yourself righteous or make yourself holy when you've been sanctified in the heart by the Lord Jesus? Fourthly, Christ bore the fire of justice for his people. That's how he sanctified us and justified us. It says here in verse 5, And one shall burn, one shall burn the heifer in his sight. Her skin and her flesh and her blood with her dung shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. There was no part left out here. That, this whole heifer, everything about it was burned in this fire. Well, on the cross, Christ gave himself entirely to the justice of God. He bore the justice of God, the fire of God's wrath, entirely. That's how Christ entirely, perfectly justified and sanctified his people in himself. Cedar wood and, and hyssop and scarlet were thrown in there with this burning heifer. Cedar wood's fragrant. Hyssop is, represents the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And scarlet is his blood. And our Lord Jesus Christ so pleased the Father by his faithfulness, by bearing our curse in the fire of God's justice. He so satisfied God that his offering came up as a fragrant smell to God, just like cedar wood. Now, fifthly, Christ continues to renew us and work this sanctifying work in our heart to make even our worship and our service clean by his blood. Look here. These men did this service for God. And everyone that took part in this service, this holy service, they're obeying God. And everyone that took part in this were unclean. They had to be washed. Look here, verse 7. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp, and the priest shall be unclean until the evening. Verse 8 says, And he that burneth her shall wash his clothes in water, and bathe his flesh in water, and shall be unclean until the evening. Verse 10, And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes, and be unclean until the evening. And it'll be unto the children of Israel and unto the Gentile. This is be so of all God's elect, Jew and Gentile. See, even the men that did this service, or the man that did it, I, I don't know if it's just Eliezer, or if he had somebody there helping him, but anybody involved in this 
was unclean. What do we learn by that? What we're doing right now is unclean if it wasn't for Christ's blood. We, even our worship and our preaching and our singing and our praise and our service to God is unclean if it was just of us because we have a sin nature and sin's mixed with everything we do. And so everything, we, one, we have to be purged inwardly so that we actually really truly worship God. You just can't come in here and worship God. God has to make you worship Him. Sometimes you come and hear the gospel and you got so much on your mind you can't even focus. It's those times when the Lord renews you and quickens you inwardly and makes you, by his word and makes you hear him, that's when you worship. And it, everything we do can only come to God and be accepted through Christ, our perfect sanctification, our perfect justification. Now sixthly, due to our sin nature, we become defiled even when we don't know it. <laughs> even when we don't know we are defiled, we become defiled. The law declares us defiled anywhere you turn, anywhere you go, anything you do. That's what Paul meant when he said, in my flesh dwells no good thing. So Paul said, in my flesh, he said, because of my flesh, I don't do the things I want to do. The things I don't want to do, that's what I do. And that's the picture here. Look at verse 11. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. You touch a dead body every day, every second of every day. How so? If the Spirit of Christ be in you, your body is dead because of sin. Spirit's life because of his righteousness, but your body's dead because of sin. See, we got a sin nature mixed with everything we do. Now look, and he'll purify, he shall purify himself with this separation water on the third day, and on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he purify not himself the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whosoever touches the dead body of any man that's dead and purifieth not himself defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. Here the tabernacle of the Lord is picturing God's holy place, the holiest of holies. We can't even pray to God and approach God unless Christ has made us pure in heart so that we see that the only way, the Hebrew writer said, we can come to God is we have boldness because we have a holy high priest at God's right hand and we come through his blood. That's why we say we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. God's people really mean that. We really are saying to God, we're not coming to you, Father, except through Christ, our righteousness and our holiness. And if man that doesn't purify himself with this water, he says that soul will be cut off from Israel because if the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him, he shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. Listen to this, what that's saying. You sitting here now, who, who have not believed on Christ, you're responsible to believe on Christ. And if you haven't believed on Christ, there is no approaching God. You can't come any other way but through the blood and righteousness and holiness of Christ Jesus. You'd be cut off. This is the law. When a man dieth in a tent, all that come into the tent and all that's in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel which hath no covering bound upon it, it's unclean. In other words, if an unseen microscopic thing, a dead thing, was in their water and they drank it, they're unclean. Whether they saw the thing and knew about it or not, they're unclean. He goes on to say there, whosoever touches one that's slain with a sword in the open field or a dead body or a bone of a man, if he even walks over a grave unmarked and unknown, he'll be unclean seven days. What's this saying? God's law, this is God's law, and God's law, all the law of God declares me and you guilty. <laughs> Just because we're conceived in sin, we're guilty in Adam. And then because of this, everything we do, even as sanctified holy children in whom God has worked his work, because of our flesh, 
we're touching a dead body all the time. That's why Christ has to continue to renew us and purge our conscience to keep looking to him. It's all of him. We don't realize how sinful we really are, brethren. We all as an un, are as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are filthy rags. The voice said, cry. He said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And the goodliness, we're not just talking about our sins, we're talking about our goodliness. Our righteousnesses are filthy rags. Now, how is your flesh going to be mortified? Which is what we saw Thursday night. It's not going to be mortified by our flesh, by our strength and our ability. How's it going to be mortified? He's, the Lord said in Isaiah, the grass withereth, the flesh is mortified, and the flower fadeth. All our righteousness become unrighteousness to us one way, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. <laughs> we're regenerated one time and, and God creates a new holy man within us and we're holy but we're renewed we're renewed all our days we're washed and per, our conscience is purged so that we continue in faith trust in Christ alone and it's Christ alone that sprinkles the blood it's the washing and renewing of the Holy Spirit he he He's the only one who makes us put off the old man and put on the new man. Remember Paul said, by the renewing of your mind, put off the old man and put on the new man. That's what we saw in Romans 8. If you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh. Yes, he'll make you, he'll make you see your sin as sinful and he'll make you hate it and despise it and he'll turn you from it to Christ. But he'll do it in such a way you'll give him all the glory for doing it. You won't boast it that you put off the old man and put on the new man. That's the different spirit I was talking about Thursday night. You hear men boasting about their holiness and how they've sanctified themselves and how holy they are. You're not hearing that in God's people. They're going to say, the Lord did it. <laughs> I didn't do it. We start minding the things of the flesh. Paul talked about that in Romans 8. And, and we hear that and... and Self-made holy men think that means sinful things, immoral things. It includes that. But he's talking about when we start minding touch not, taste not, handle not, and start thinking we've made ourselves holy or righteous by our works. And, and he said there's only one way that we're going, that dead flesh is going to be mortified, and that's the Spirit of Christ quickening you, inwardly. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, and yet, yet I live, yet not I. The life I live, I live by the faithfulness of Christ. He's the one that purges my conscience and keeps me looking only to Christ. You know what we do when this work is done? We may have been praying, just like Saul of Tarsus was praying, 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 and he never prayed. It was in his flesh, he was just saying prayers. But whenever the Lord worked this in his heart, the Lord told Ananias, behold, he prayeth. You know what we do? Then we cry, Abba, Father. We call on him to be our all. Then the Hebrew writer says, we draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, <laughs> looking to Christ only, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, the blood and ashes of the true red heifer. Now lastly, is there anybody defiled? Anybody defiled? Christ is the fountain open for sin and uncleanness. Look here, verse 9, back up there, he says, A man that's clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It's a purification for sin. You know who that clean man is and you know where that clean place is? It's Christ Jesus at the right hand of God our Father. And look here, verse 17, and he said, And for the unclean person that shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer purification for sin, 
and running water should be put there too in the vessel. That's why they're uncovering the pool of Siloam and filling it up with water. They want, they want running water. That was water that ran down into that pool from springs above. Look in your margin, and if you have a King James translation, the margin says that's living water. Christ said, if any man's thirsty, let him come unto me, and out of his belly shall flow living water. That means the constant, continual, flowing, renewing of the Spirit of our Lord. That's how this work's done in the heart. A clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water. Christ takes it, dips it, and comes with his blood, verse 19. And here's, the, here's what he does. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day. And on the seventh day, listen now, he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be clean in evening. What does this washing of ourselves typify? Christ said, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they'll mourn for me like one mourns for his own son. It pictures faith. It pictures repentance and faith, having our minds changed that, so that we don't see any goodness in any ourselves, our nature, or anything we've done, so that we turn and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ alone. When the Lord called Paul, he said, he's a chosen vessel unto me to declare my name. And through the preaching of the gospel, Christ Jesus does this. He said, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. That is in me. And that's what we're talking about. Does that mean you're going to stop sinning? Well, you may, you will put away some outward sins, but that's not why you're holy. You're holy because He did this work in your heart. <laughs> you wouldn't. That's the result of Him making you holy. You turn to Christ, and you find you're all in Christ. The running waters, the washing and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And Christ works this in such power that when he does it, no flesh will glory in his presence. But you'll say, all praise and honor and glory to the Lord. He's made righteousness unto us and sanctification unto us. Has he washed you inwardly right now? Has he, has he been, he's doing it? This is how he does it, it's through this word. If he has, then come and plunge in the fountain. Well, well you want me to come down to the front? No. You just look to Christ. Isn't that how the, they were saved from the serpents in the wilderness? Anybody that looks will live. Listen, Zechariah 13, 1, In that day there should be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. What do we say when we come to the Lord? We come confessing what David did in Psalm 51. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. All my righteousnesses, my acts of righteousness are sin, and I was conceived in iniquity. All I am is sin. That's true repentance. And we beg him, Lord, would you purge me with hyssop? <laughs> Who? What did we see here? The clean man took hyssop and dipped it in this water and purged the people with it. You cry out, Lord, will you come and purge me with hyssop? Then I'll be clean. I'll really be clean. And then I'll teach others that this is the only way they can be clean. He said if we confess our sin, that means not just some bad things you did, that means everything you are and everything you have ever done, good and bad, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins. That's our righteousness because of Christ that justified us. That's not all. And to cleanse us, that's the sanctifying work in the heart keeping you looking only to Christ, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
You see, if you can, if you can call on him and confess you are, you are nothing and Christ is all, he's already washed you. It's the only way, you, only way you'll do it. And he says, and I'll continue to cleanse you, keep you looking to me. That's the gospel. This nonsense that's going on over there, ain't nobody going to be made pure by that. It's just going to be some poor dead red heifer burned in a fire and some old stale water from the pool of Siloam. This is the living water by which we're sanctified. If, the, if that did it ceremonially back in Moses' day, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? I pray he blessed that. Let's go to him. Our Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, that you have worked this in the hearts of, of our brethren sitting here in our own heart. We pray, Lord, you continue to renew us and quicken us. And don't ever let us look to the works of our hands to think we've made ourselves righteous or holy. Keep us looking only to Christ. Lord, mortify our flesh today. Make us just regard it as a dead thing by turning us to Christ above and making us behold him. This is our need. This is, our, this is the health of our soul. This is our need. No matter what else in this life you provide, we'll be thankful for it. But Lord, we need this work done in our hearts continually. We confess to you, Lord, we are sin and all our works are sin. We need to be found in Christ's righteousness alone. For his sake, Lord, for the sake of our great high priest, we ask you to receive us and hear us and work this for us. Amen.